Good morning. I am Sharon Fisher, and I would like to thank you for joining us today for the Introduction to Flash Chromatography webinar presented by Josh Lovell, Teledyne ISCO Application Chemist. Josh will be giving us insight into flash chromatography, the similarities and differences of flash and HPLC, and the benefits of automated flash chromatography. With that, I would like to turn this over to Josh. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll be doing our uh, introduction to flash chromatography. If you guys have any questions, feel free to enter them uh, uh, in the question box on the side, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, but thanks for joining us today. Um, today's out, uh, outline for today is going to be discussing what drives chromatographic separation, uh, some similarities and differences between flash and prep, and why you may prep HVLC and why you would choose one over the other. We're going to show some benefits of automated chroma, uh, flash chromatography, getting started with flash chromatography, including choosing stationary and mobile phases, uh, going from a TLC method to a flash method, and then uh, some different flash loading techniques and guidelines. And then ultimately, we want to focus on how to optimize our baseline resolution because that's where we're going to gain the most efficiency for our separation. And then finally, we're going to talk about our next-gen uh, flash automated flash chromatography instrument and how it can offer faster, greener, and better separations for your use. So how does chromatography separate compounds? We have two phases in our uh, liquid chromatography, our mobile phase and our stationary phase, our column packing. Um, ultimately, our uh, separation is going to be limited by sample solubility. And what we're looking at is the interaction between the sample uh, with the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So if we look at this uh, picture on the right here, <coughs> uh, we see our compound molecule in blue, and we have our solvent uh, alcohol molecules and water molecules, and then we also have the functional groups from the silica, functionalized silica there. And so the interaction between the uh, compound with the solvent, with the functionalized so like in this case, it's uh, C18 um, functional group is going to dictate how quickly that molecule moves through the col through the uh, stationary phase and down the column. Um, kind of the same principles are going to apply for normal versus reverse phase as far as that interaction between the, the uh, stationary phase and mobile phase in your compound. So what is flash chromatography? And it's a purification technique utilizing the stationary phase and the mobile phase. And originally, we, uh, this was developed to replace open column chromatography, a large glass column, and um, gravity-assisted um, separation of compounds down the silica with solvent. Uh, we apply pressure to the column reservoir to speed up the, the mobile phase. And now this, is, this pressure is applied via pumps. Uh, traditionally, this is used silica gel as a stationary phase, and this is your normal phase, um, allows for normal phase, mobile phase use. So why would we want to choose using PrEP HP, HPLC or flash chromatography? And ultimately, the goal of the two is to purify a mixture of compounds. So we have the same goal for both of them. Um, and we can quantify the separation um, between the compounds using the resolution equation. And so the actual equation isn't, you don't need to know the specifics of the equation, but knowing the, the parts of the equation helps define um, why we want to choose certain conditions and how we can fine tune conditions to improve our resolution. And so those three parts are efficiency, the second part is selectivity, and the last part is retention. Um, and so we'll discuss some different ways that we can adjust these variables via experimental conditions to improve our resolution and which ones offer us the most to, get, most to gain. If we look at a flash and a prep HPLC system, the uh, general flow scheme is very similar. We have our solvent re reservoirs, uh, gradient pump, um, that forms the gradient and solvent pump. We have a valve to introduce, introduce our sample. Uh, we have our column that offers the, the separation. And then that leads to a detector. And when you're doing flash or prep, that's normally going to give you uh, divert to a fraction collector so you can have automated peak collection. Um, if you do an analytical HPLC, this is where you go, go ahead and do your integration or quantitation of your results. 
Now for the differences between flash and prep HPLC. So flash chromatography is low pressure, uh, so less than 300 psi, and HPLC is going to be a higher pressure system, usually greater than 1,000 psi. Um, flash chromatography has smaller particle sizes because of this pressure limitation. Um, these are lower efficiency columns. They're less expensive and they're disposable. Um, but because of the larger particle size, we don't have the same separation efficiency we see with uh, an HPLC column that has a smaller particle size, uh, which offers increased resolution. So that's the trade-off of being more expensive. Um, however, those are, are reusable columns. So. The flash chromatography really focused on purification uh, as fast as possible. We want to get as much compound as pure as fast as possible. Prep HPLC is really focused on um, analysis, quantitation, and prep HPLC is really used in late stage purification so we can really get a high purity sample uh, of our compound. Flash chromatography is high flow and high sample loading. And with PrEP HPLC, you're going to be looking at reduced sample loadings because of the uh, functionalization of the um, silica, which reduces your, your uh, sample loading ability. So traditionally normal phase of your flash chromatography, which increases sample loading, and then uh, modified silica for HPLC, and a lot of times that's C18, uh, all those, we'll see some different phases that we'll discuss later also. It's going to be a reverse phase technique traditionally. So PrEP HPLC offers you higher resolving power. Uh, it also offers offers some information rich detection options, and allows for quantitation and analysis. Then there's a broad range of stationary phase chemistries that are offered. Um, you see many analytical columns with uh, various different stationary phases and chemistries that allow for a lot of different selectivities. Um, by changing our stationary phase. Uh, flash doesn't have as many stationary phases uh, available, but there's still a variety that you can choose from. Uh, so flash chromatography, the advantage of this would be speed in, mill in purifying milligrams to grams of material. Um, so the larger scale purifications, flash chromatography really stands out. Um, typically, you can get a purity of greater than 90% on a single pass after your flash separation. Um, the operation costs are a lot lower than your HPLC, so uh, you know the startup costs for uh, the systems are going to be less expensive, and then the cost of the actual columns that you're using is less expensive than the, the prep HPLC column. The other thing is you're able to put more sample on your com uh, on to these columns than the prep columns, and this allows you uh, reduce. Uh, cost and solvent savings, basically. So here's, the, we're going to go through a, a real life example of some of the benefits from using automated flash chromatography system uh, versus doing open column chromatography. So the benefits of automation, so this example we're trying to separate these uh, two amides. Uh, they have RF values that are um, within 0.1 uh, of each other, so they're fairly um, close alluding. Um, <clears throat> the TLCs here on the right, 30% ethyl acetate and heptane here, you can see the spots are pretty close together um, as you visualize it. So these are pretty close alluding. It's going to limit the amount of compound we can load on the, on the column. You can see the two compounds in there. So when we do an open bed uh, column or open column chromatography uh, through glass column in the hood, um, our goal is to achieve 100% purity of both compounds. Uh, to do that, we're not able to do a gradient uh, um, very easily with the open column chromatography. So we would have to do like an isocratic method. And to do that, we would have to use a 20% ethyl acetate and heptase solution to get the kind of resolution we would need to separate out the compound. So you can see if we do a stronger solvent, we can do it in a shorter amount of time, but we're getting more of a mixed, 
mixed fractions between the two compounds uh, in the 30 percent hot lava state heptane. And we can improve the resolution and separation using 25 percent by reducing that B percent B polarity uh, solvent strength. And then we can finally get separation into individual test tubes uh, using 20 percent ethyl acetate heptane. So we get 22 total fractions when we get complete separations and um, open column purification. So we get complete separation between the two compounds rather than mixed impure mixtures of A and B. So we could take this a step further. Maybe we could do a step gradient um, where we gradually increase the uh, percent B. So we start at 10% and then step up to 20%, uh, 25, and then 30%. And we can get um, our fractions down to 15 fractions using step gradient. So that improves our separation. Um, but there's a, there's a pretty good gap between A and B um, with basically empty uh, uh, test tubes of just solvent. There's no compound in them. So we've gone through more solvent. Um, if we do a linear optimized gradient over a range of 10 to 30 percent, uh, as in the second case here, we're able to do this in 16 fractions and reduce the amount of solvent, solvent used. Uh, so we've optimized our separation where we get separation between the two compounds and we also minimize the amount of salt we use and the amount of time it takes to purify it. So we kind of compare these different examples, the number of fractions is, is less, the step and optimized gradient. Um, the amount of solvent generated is significantly less using the automated um, optimized gradient there by about 200 milliliters. And so as you imagine, if you scale up, that's going to be solvent savings that are even greater. And then the time of purification in this case, we, we saved about eight minutes uh, compared to the isocratic separation. So um, with an even more optimized method, we could probably decrease the amount of time for this purification. So next thing we're going to be discussing is how to get started with flash chromatography. We're going to be, you know, what kind of choices do you need to make when you have your, your sample? You need to choose what column. Um, what kind of mobile phase you want to use, and then how we can develop a method on TLC. And then finally, how do we load our compound and then create an optimized method for our separation? So the first choice is really uh, what column do I want to use on my, my system? And essentially, we want to choose a stationary phase um, for a column. So flash chromatography on the left there, uh, the list of um, different stationary phases that are available. The most predominant flash is the silica, so we've kind of ordered it in the uh, order of use. And so there are, uh, you know, C18 is, is also popular, but not as much as the silica. And then you have even more specialty um, functionalization of C18A2, uh, C8 columns that are really good for uh, peptides and proteins and, and larger molecules, uh, alumina columns, and then uh, there's ion exchange columns available out there, dial, cyano columns. And finally, uh, amine columns are also very useful for some of the purification of some amines that uh, have the protonated amine offers some difficulty with purification in silica and reverse phase. With HPLC, the more common uh, stationary phase is your C18, so that's the most popular. Uh, and then we also have the same. Uh, functionalizations that we have in the flash chromatography, and there's even a wider variety out there too. So. so the importance of our stationary phase um, is it really goes towards uh, retention and, and efficiency in the resolution equation. So um, selectivity is greatly affected by changes to the stationary phase. And these are both key parts of the resolution equation here. And ultimately, column efficiency is going to be dictated by how well the column is packed. So um, particle size between the columns is going to be very important in how, well the how efficient the column is. And so there's two kinds of particles that can be packed in the column, spherical 
and irregular particles. Um, your spherical particles are going to pack uh, much more efficiently and offer greater um, efficiency and greater resolution versus your regularly packed particle or particles that are irregular shaped. Um, and so we offer two uh, products to do that. Um, our ready set gold material is a spherical particle. It's a smaller particle of 20 to 40 micrometer um, particle size. And essentially this offers about twice the resolution power versus our uh, traditional ready set material. And this allows for twice the loading capacity. Uh, it allows for higher optimal flow rates um, and also uh, twice the resolution power. So increasing the loading allows us to use smaller columns. Uh, this means that we use less solvent and we can gain cost and time savings by using the smaller column and using less solvent. So kind of to illustrate the, the loading effect, so if I have a gold column and I can load up to 20% um, of my sample silica weight on there. So I could load uh, 2.4 grams of compound onto a 12 gram column, onto a gold column. <clears throat> to load that much onto a, a traditional ready sub column, which has the irregular particles, I would need to go up to a 24 gram column. So basically I can scale down a column size by using the gold material. Now the importance of that is not only using a, a smaller column, which is cheaper, but uh, we can also decrease the amount of solvent we can use, which I'll illustrate in a sec. Um, but basically the, the idea here is if you use proper scaling, you're choosing the proper column, is that we can maximize efficiency and meet need to minimize excess. So we want to choose the smallest column that will provide an adequate separation. Uh, the higher quality silica provides a superior separation. And that increases our loading capacity, allowing us to do this. This leads to reduction in solvent use, time of separation, and cost savings. Um, and then also doing a scouting run on a smaller column if you have a large scale purification uh, allows you to establish the loading amount and then verify and optimize your method so it's more efficient. And so we can do this to, to all of our methods as, as far as. Uh, optimizing them to, to minimize the amount of solvent that we're using. This allows us saving time and money and it's, it's being green, so that, that's very good. So to illustrate how we can the actual solvent savings by um, scaling to the correct size column using the gold column. So if I were to choose uh, to purify the 2.5, 2.4 grams of material on a ready set column, um, or on a ready set gold column versus a ready set column, I would save about 200 milliliters over that separation. Uh, as I scale up, my savings are more, or as I uh, go to larger columns, uh, my savings are more. So as I scale down from a 40 gram to a 24 gram column, I'm saving almost 300 milliliters. And then again, from the 80 to 40, it's almost uh, 650 milliliters. And I'm saving almost two liters if I'm, a, if I'm working at the 220 gram scale and I can scale down to a 120 gram column. So those are significant solvent savings that you guys can um, realize in the lab by uh, you know, scaling down to the next uh, smaller column using the gold columns. So. so the next choice, so we've chosen a stationary phase and a lot of times it's silica. So if we're working in silica or working in the normal phase traditionally, uh, so we're looking at hexane, up acetate, um, HDCM, methanol. So here's a list of additional solvents you guys can choose to use based upon their similarity. So we've organized them into groups for you. Um, this is from a, a John Dolan and Snyder, um, adapted from them. Uh, but basically it's, it's grouped solvents based upon their similarities as far as their uh, hydrogen donor capabilities, hydrogen acceptor capabilities, and their dipole moments so that you can look at different solvents and then choose alternatives that may be um, better suited for your, your lab. So you see a lot of the alcohols together in group two, uh, you know, a group of ethers, uh, 
you know, THF, BMF, uh, DCM kind of by itself, ethyl acetate, acetone as a group. And then the, the nice thing about this is that if you're having problems doing a separation, you try to actually an ethyl acetate and you're not getting good separations, you can choose a different group um, of solvent to maybe gain um, some selectivity by switching up to a different group. So something that's, that's different rather than switching to a uh, solvent that is very similar. So this kind of guides you in, in choices and allowing you to eliminate possibilities for better separation. Uh, here's another way we can quantify the differences in the solvent. So we can look at the polarity of the solvent um, and, and realizing what the solvent strength is. So you know, at the bottom, hexane is a traditional base solvent that's used, and a lot of times you'll mix that with ethyl acetate as a polar solvent. Um, other times, for more polar compounds, maybe dichloromethane is a better base solvent, and then a lot of people will mix that with methanol to help move that uh, uh, compound down the column. So this is just to illustrate some different solvents that are common in um, flash chromatography and how you guys can adjust your method based upon the solvent strength. So how do we turn our TLC data into flash methods? So most people are familiar with TLCs. Uh, you know, we look at this to see how pure our, our sample is and how well it will dilute down the column. So your sample is traditionally spotted under the TLC plate using the gap glass cap capillary. Uh, and then we develop this, this uh, plate using a solvent system. And that's our mobile phase. And our plate is our stationary phase, and this simulates how the compound would behave on the column. And so we can see the spots there after we develop the TLC. Uh, you'll see you know, one spot travels farther than the other, and we're able to get some separation between them. And so we can quantify that separation um, using the RF factor, the retention factor. And so we can look at the distance the compound traveled versus the distance the uh, solvent traveled, and we can uh, determine what the retention factor is. And so now we can quantify how well that compound be behaves in that solvent system. <clears throat> and so this is important because then we can translate that to uh, uh, conditions for our call or uh, flash chromatography. And you can see here we've got the impurities that eluded near the solvent front. Our target compound moved about a, a a quarter, a third of the way up the plate versus the impurities, so we're able to get good separation of the target compound versus our impurities. So a lot of people are familiar with the RF retention factor, um, but when we're actually thinking about flash chromatography, it's a little bit easier to think in column volumes. So a compound that alludes to the solvent front essentially would be moving down um, we would have an RF of one, it's eluding with the solvent front, and that would equate to one column volume. So that compound would be basically traveling down the solvent front, down the column, in one column volume. So the RF values are inversely proportional to the elution time um, of the compound from a, a column here. So CB is one over the RF, and if our RF is 0 0.31, then our column volume is going to be 3.2, so about three column volumes. So we've always wanted to work in, the, we want to try to get our compound in the RF of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 uh, for good separation. It means it's interacting with the stationary phase. And so we're looking at column volumes of about 3 to 5, um, moving proportionate to that. So. so in this case, our compound would elude around 3.2 column volumes, uh, and that would be a good a good separation for our compound. The other thing is that we can use the CVs, we can use that to define how much sample we're loading. So uh, with RF, uh, we look at the delta RF between the two values, uh, but we really want to look at the delta CVs um, between the two compounds to determine how much we can load on that. So we can determine the delta CV by looking at the uh, 1 over the RF of compound 1 minus 1 over the RF of compound 2. And this gives us a better predictor for a column separation. Is it going to be a difficult separation? Is it going to be pretty easy so we can load more compound onto it? 
um, and we can use our loading guide um, to determine how much compound we can load. But finally, within the, the next gen software, we offer a grading optimizer, and basically it allows you to it asks you to run two TLC plates with a single solvent system. So, for example, uh, we'd run a compound at 30% ethyl acetate and hexane, and then run that same sample in a TLC of 50% ethyl acetate and hexane. And what you're going to do is determine the RF values for your target compound and the nearest impurity. And both of these results need to be between 0.2 and 0.8 for your RF value. Um, you're going to plug these values into peak track and then an optimized gradient is developed. So um, we've ran the two TLC plates here, it comes up with these RF values. We'll go ahead and plug them in. Um, you'll notice the gradient optimizer tab on the top right there, the method editor. It'll bring up this window with the instructions we just described. And then you just need to plug in the values for your solvent system and your impurities and it'll go ahead and calculate a gradient for you. So you'll hit OK, and it'll create an optimized gradient for the separation to isolate your target compound. So now that we've developed a method, uh, we need to determine how we want to load our compound. So there's essentially two ways that we can load compounds onto the flash system. We can load them as a liquid, or we can load them um, pre-absorbed on the silica. Um, or another stationary phase. And so we'll discuss that, discuss both of those um, methods here. So first we're going to start with the simplest, which would be just a liquid injection onto the column. And this works really great for uh, neat liquid samples, so uh, they're not dissolved in a, uh, any solvent, uh, although we can use a weak dissolution solvent if we, if we need to. Um, if the compound is not liquid, we can dissolve the sample and add it directly to the column after we do the equilibration. And we're going to be limited by kind of the same rules that we were taught in basic organic chemistry with traditional open column chromatography and that we need to minimize the amount of solvent that we're dissolving our compound in and that we want to dissolve that compound in the weakest dissolution solvent that we can. And so Here's an example of doing a um, liquid injection using a strong solvent versus a weak solvent. And visually, we can see on the left here where we've injected the same amount of compound um, using a strong solvent. You'll notice that it's basically eluding down the entire column. We have a band that's basically the entire column length um, using a strong solvent. So as we're loading that compound, the strong solvent's carrying our compound down with the solvent front. So that's not good for separation. On the right, we can see that when we load that with a weak, uh, weak solvent, we basically don't see the band at all. It's all in the cap. And then it starts to loop down the column as we begin our um, delivering our mobile phase. And so you'll notice the band is a lot smaller. It's about a quarter to a third of the column versus um, with the strong solvent. We can actually see the bandwidth of the chromatogram, too, is a lot wider. So we see a bandwidth of, of probably about seven minutes from baseline to baseline on the strong solvent versus about three to four, say four minutes for the weak solvent. So we've minimized the band broadening um, due to the strong solvent effect here by using the weaker solvent. An alternate way. Um, <coughs> To, to load our sample, and probably superior, um, it offers superior results in most cases, is to use your solid sample loading. Um, and so this is really good for hard to dissolve compounds that would require you to use a large amount of uh, strong solvent to do a liquid injection. Um, this offers you good resolution. It's going to minimize your band broadening and then increase your separation efficiency because we've minimized that band broadening. Um, the key, though, is that you need to make sure that you remove any solvent that you've used to load it onto the, the stationary phase. Um, if not, you're going to see the same kind of results as loading with this, um, a liquid injection. And so to do this method, there's, there's two ways you can do this. We have our solid load cartridge. 
And so you can dissolve your compound um, in any solvent that would evaporate. And then you're going to go ahead and absorb it onto the silica. And then you go ahead and evaporate the solvent from the silica mixture and then load it onto an empty solid loaded cartridge cap. So we have we offer empty solid loaded cartridge caps and bare silica that you guys can load it onto. Um, the alternative is you can use pre-packed uh, solid load cartridges and you can dissolve your compound and then add it onto the pre-packed solid load cartridge and then dry it with a, um, the air purge on the system or, or a strain of air um, to evaporate the solvent from the silica. And so here's some examples of the benefits from your doing a solid sample load. And so if we do a purification with a pre-packed solid load cartridge with proper drying, we can see that we get baseline resolution between our two compounds here on the left. Um, and then when we take HPLC, analytical HPLC of these peaks, we see that we only have one peak in each, um, each fraction there. So we were able to maintain, or we were able to um, establish baseline separation and, and isolate our peak. Now, if we did that same sample on a solid load cartridge that we didn't dry uh, prior to running, you can see that the peaks start to co-elute, uh, and we don't have resolution. We don't have baseline resolution between the peaks. And then when you do the analytical HPLC, you can see that there's a, there's a minor component there um, in both of those uh, samples. So we weren't able to uh, purify our compound as pure as we'd like. So that's why it's important to go ahead and dry your, your sample load cartridges. And you can also compare this to your, to your liquid loading too. Um, these are kind of benefits you would do, but gain from doing the solid sample loading. And finally, the last section about uh, method development is, is think, think about, thinking about ways that we can improve our baseline resolution and improve our separation. And so flash purification is always a balancing act. So I mean, our goal is to, to get as pure a compound uh, as possible, but we need to balance that with time, solvent, and cost savings. And so ultimately, our set, all of our separations are unique. Everybody has different compounds and different properties that the properties of the compounds they're trying to separate. So every separation is unique. Um, but how well the separation performs is ultimately going to be determined by how closely the two compounds dilute. And so if you have a large RF difference or large delta CV difference, we can take advantage of increased baseline separation and we can, we can do some things with that. So we can increase our sample loading. Um, if we, if we want to take advantage of that baseline separation. The other thing we could do is we could modify our method to, maybe we don't have more sample to purify. We can modify the method by um, increasing the flow rate to save time or maybe shortening the gradient. Uh, to save some solvent, um, and then we can get rid of any excess resolution that we don't need um, and take advantage of those savings elsewhere. Now, if you have a really small RF difference or small delta CV, and your compounds are really almost colluding together or very small uh, difference, they're difficult to separate. We really need to maximize resolution to get separation. So to maximize the separation, so our ready set gold columns in our next gen software, or peak track software, um, recognizes these gold columns and it offers us um, a choice. How do we want to take advantage of the increased um, resolving power of the gold columns? So we can we can do that. We can maximize resolution by choosing the gold resolution method. Um, this offers a longer gradient at lower flow rates to optimize resolution. Uh, or we could choose the gold speed method, which is a shorter gradient at higher flow rates to save time and solvent. But if we want to optimize the method for resolution, ways we could do that would be lengthening the gradient by choosing the gold resolution method. Um, another way, the gold resolution is going to be a default method from 0 to 100%. But if we can focus that gradient over a 20 to 30% range, um, we're increasing the amount of time that the, the compound is in the, it's, it's effective. Uh, um, separation uh, range where it's actually traveling down the column. So by focusing our gradient, if you think about our compounds on the column, 
they're basically doing one of three things. They're either sitting at the top of the column doing nothing, not traveling at all, and that would be as if it's, if it's in a weak solvent, and that would mean that the K is very, um, very large, your retention is very large. Uh, it's actually traveling down the column, and that's when our K is in the range of about 1 to 10. And then finally, when it's traveling basically at the solvent front or off the column. Um, so once it's off the column, any gradient after that fact is not going to be any use to you. So if you have a compound that comes off at about 20%, running a gradient to 100% um, is kind of a waste of solvent because it's already off the column at that point. So running that same method from 0 to 20%, you can increase your resolution. Um, the other thing to maximize resolution is we can decrease the amount that we're, of sample that we're loading on it. And you know other experimental choices we can make if we need to maximize resolution is you can choose your ready set bolt columns if you're using traditional ready set or other media. Uh, you could scale up to a larger column, um, and that essentially is decreasing your sample loading, but you're scaling up to a larger column. Uh, you could stack two smaller columns together if you need. If you don't have a column size, so maybe you don't have a 40 gram column, but you've got two 24 gram columns, you can stack those together and gain a resolution that way. And the other thing is you can go ahead and choose a different stationary phase and maybe get some different selectivity for your compounds or different mobile phase uh, by changing your solvent system. So finally, let's talk about the next gen here and some case examples of, of doing uh, maximizing our resolution and taking advantage of some of the features our next gen offers. Um, so this is an il illustration of um, a ready set um, gold method um, and, th and the speed method and the time savings using the ready set uh, gold columns. Okay. So on the left here, this is the ready set using the gold speed method. So it's a mixture of two compounds, and we get uh, fairly good. Um, separation there between the compounds. There's some coalition between the compounds, but uh, it's to help illustrate this case. So <clears throat> using the, uh, that's the traditional ready set column on the left, sorry. So when we go to the gold column, you can see the improvement. We can get baseline resolution basically between the two compounds using the ready set gold column and that same gold speed method. And to illustrate how focusing the gradient improves your baseline resolution. So now we can use the ready set column, gold column using the focus gold speed method. And so it's running from about 25 to 35 percent. It's over a 10 percent range. And so you've maximized your baseline resolution from where it was basically peak to peak. Now we have about 20 second baseline resolution between the two compounds. So this is to illustrate one, going to the ready set gold, and then two, focusing that range down to maximize resolution between those two compounds. And so the time savings by doing the gold speed method, we can save up to uh, 40 to 60, 30 to 60%, depending on what column size we're using from our previous generation, the RF plus there. Uh, so there's been significant savings in time down to, you know, three minute method uh, on a 12 gram column, uh, five minutes on a 40 gram column. So there's a lot of time savings. Um, there's even time savings on the default side there. You can do an eight minute method on your 12 gram column and still get very good resolution. Uh, and that's still 50% time saving versus our old instrument. Uh, additionally, the capabilities of the next gen, we can go up to 300 mils a minute uh, versus the previous limit of 200 mils a minute. So this allows us to maintain similar linear, linear velocity across the range of columns as we scale up and offers us time savings because we're able to um, go into a higher range of flow rate at the larger column. So in the case there at the 40 gram column, 12 minute method, 5 minute method for the speed, 40% uh, time savings for both of them. So <clears throat> the next slide is how we can improve the resolution by changing columns um, and using um, a ready set gold using the resolution method. And it illustrates kind of the same point uh, from before. So using the default method with the ready set, um, instead of the speed method, we can get separate, baseline separation. We can improve that separation further by using the ready set gold and the gold resolution method. 
And then finally doing the focus gradient, we can get uh, about a minute of uh, baseline separation between the two, where with the gold speed method, we had about 20 seconds of separation. So this is just to illustrate it um, for these two compounds and, and the kind of the savings you get by going to a focus gradient um, and going to the ready set fold column. Uh, so the solvent savings on the next chain with optimized methods. Um, from our previous generation, we have solvent savings from 7 to almost 50% uh, on the methods because of the changes in the dwell volumes of the system. Um, we've increased the method efficiency to maximize the solvent savings across all the column sizes. And an additional feature of the 300, 300 plus that is new is the baseline correction feature. And this allows uh, you to run a short pre-run gradient to measure your baseline resolution, baseline absorbance, sorry, um, as the uh, gradient's progressing. And we can subtract that baseline from the run. And this expands your detection abilities across all wavelengths. And so we're not limited by solvent UV cutoff anymore. Um, for example, you could use acetone as a solvent. You could use uh, ethyl acetate at uh, 210 now at lower wavelengths, where traditionally you wouldn't be able to because of the rising baseline. Um, and this could open up greener solvent alternatives uh, and then also allow you to choose solvents that maybe exhibit different selectivities so you can create more efficient separation. To enable this feature, you would uh, go to your baseline or go to your method editor, click the details button, and then choose the baseline correction. So here's some examples of the baseline correction. And so this is uh, without baseline correction using ethyl acetate as a B solvent. And so at 215, uh, ethyl acetate is going to um, be visible to the UV, UV detector. We're going to see the, the ethyl acetate as it increases percentage. And you can see that without the baseline correction on. We can't see the peaks, especially the second peak. Uh, but with baseline correction turned on, uh, we can observe both of those peaks um, in the baseline. We don't see that baseline increase of the percentage of that processing. Another example is this case we're using acetone as a solvent. Um, at, uh, and so you can see the on the bottom example there, you can see that the baseline increasing with acetone. Um, and then the top example there is with baseline correction on, and we're able to use acetone as a solvent um, alternative. Uh, the next gen, uh, you know, a good feature for reusable columns, if you're using the C18 columns or reusable columns, is you can track the column data on your, uh, uh, using the RFID tag on the columns, you click the column data tab in the method editor, and it'll tell you what, how many times that column's been used, what was the last flow rate it was used at, and uh, what solvent was last used on it to the date of last use. So it's a good way to keep track of your columns that a lot of people maybe aren't aware of. So I want to let you guys know that. And finally, we're gonna, uh, some of the safety features of the next gen that are nice uh, is the active solvent waste level sensing. Um, we have the, uh, it'll show you how much solvent you're going to be using before you begin your run. So you don't waste time by running the, the column dry. Uh, it's also going to stop the run if you run out of solvent or if the waste level sensing detects a full container so you don't have an overflow. Um, there's the optional vapor hood if you want to use vapor enclosure for the next gen. You can hook this up to a snorkel um, outside of the hood. There's a port on the back so that you can hook that up and you don't have to take up valuable hood space. Um, and you can still minimize your exposure to solvent vapor. And the vapor sensing is another optional um, uh, feature on the next gen, so it allows you to stop the run if any vapor is detected as far as uh, leaking solvent um, or an overfill situation within the, uh, the tubes. So, and it's got some fancy lights on it that you can kind of see the tube there and also light up red light if there's an air state and alert uh, when your run's done downwards. Uh, so kind of summary of what we discussed today was the basic mechanisms for uh, chromatographic separation. We compared some similarities and differences between the flash and HPLC. We had some real real world examples of the cost and time savings of using an automated flash system. Uh, the importance of choosing a stationary phase and a mobile phase in uh, our initial method 
development choices in flash chromatography. The different ways we can do sample loading on the flash systems and why you would choose one over the other and the uh, benefits of doing a solid sample load. And then ultimately we've discussed uh, numerous different ways you can maximize resolution or you can trade off resolution by uh, reducing solvent use in different ways. And then how the next gen can kind of meet your needs um, of an automated flash system that can save you time, solvent costs, and maximize your separation abilities. So uh, thank you for your time today and we'll open it up for the questions. Well, at this time, there are no questions. We'll leave it open um, for a little bit to see if any of you do have questions. Sort of a question here. Um, so the, the question here is the baseline correction setting the same as the real one. How does it recognize and subtract it from the real one? So basically, we run that initial gradient completely. Um, and so as we run that gradient, we're able to track that point in time and then subtract that as it goes. So um, That feature works 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 fairly reliably in that regard. So it does a pre-run grade uh, before when you have the baseline correction enabled. So the baseline correction is kind of a neat feature. It allows you to, you know open up some non-traditional solvents that maybe you guys were limited in, in using before. Um, acetone is kind of a nice alternative to ethyl acetate sometimes. Um, offers a little bit different selectivity for some different compounds. Um, another one that people, uh, another solvent that might be advantageous for people to use is polyween um, as a solvent there. Uh, also, that take advantage of the baseline correction feature. Uh, so again, I have a very good question. Uh, is it, we, we do demo practice, uh, we do demo system. Um, so we do do demos uh, in some cases. Uh, the best way to do that would be to contact us and we can be in contact with your sales rep or distributor for your area. Um, so feel free to email me uh, and I can get that information to offer uh, people so they can contact you. Okay. Uh, then, uh, the last question here is how uh, kind of the difference between liquid and sam uh, solid sample uh, injection. So if we go back to uh, back on the PowerPoint, uh, go back to this section. Quick. Go back to it here to show the difference. Loading techniques, sorry. So the two methods here, so we do liquid injection. Uh, I like to use this really on samples that um, are liquid without any solvent added to them. Uh, it's going to give me the smallest band, basically, uh, as it'll loop down, down the column. So our, our, when we do our separation, we're always going to be limited by our starting um, uh, starting band, right? That's going to be kind of our, our initial limitation. So anytime we can minimize the initial band, um, it's going to be beneficial to increasing the separation efficiency. So in this case, when we load this with a strong solvent, this compound wants to start traveling down the column right away with it. Um, and so that's going to cause band broadening. Uh, if we use a weaker solvent, 
uh, that compound is not going to travel once it gets onto the silica at all. It's going to basically interact with the silica and sit there. And so when we do weak solvent dissolution and it's a compound that's not traveling probably until later in your chromatography, we get a good band size like on the right. Now if we do the sample, solid sample load cartridge, Um, so this is going to give us our optimal chromatography because we're basically we're eliminating that solvent that's going to cause the band broadening. Um, the compound is not going to start moving down the column until the mobile phase uh, characteristics for it are. Um, so the, the mobile phase characteristics are strong enough to elute it down the column. So basically it's not band broadening as the, the system is ramping up to the percentage that needs to travel. Um, the solid load cartridges are really easy to use. And you, you know, if you have a, a crude compound with a, you know, maybe it's got some solid impurities in it, you can load that into the silicon and it's basically just going to sit on the silicon and not dissolve and, and cause problems to your chromatography. So, um, the solid sample loading is a really good technique and one that we use a lot. Um, another good question is can you change the flow rate during the run? Um, and you can change the flow rate on the fly. Uh, definitely, you can do that on the fly. You can do that in the method editor. You can also do it on the main screen. Um, the other thing you can do, and this kind of goes along with it, is you can change your solvent too. So if you have a, co a compound that tends to be sitting on the column, um, you know, maybe it's if, if it's binding really strongly to the silica, even when you get to 100% ethyl acetate. Is you can go ahead and flush that with an alternate solvent at the end, um, you know, like an acetone or uh, methanol, depending on um, as long as you're not doing a basic separation. So you can use methanol to wash that down the column at the end. So you can build that into your method, or you can do that on the fly. You can change your solvents on the fly too um, at the end of the run to flush your compound off the column. But so one of the questions was um, how to wash the column at the end of, to get your sample out because the sample's getting stuck to the column, basically. So that's one way you can do it. Um, but you can do that in the method editor. You can do that in the uh, on the main screen on the fly. You can change from uh, one solvent to another and change those percentages and, and the flow rates there. Um, changing the flow rate probably isn't so helpful um, as your compound's coming out. Um, we're already kind of in an optimal flow rate range. so. Once it's traveled down the column and you're starting to detect it, it's, it's towards the end of the column anyways. You don't really have much to gain there. Um, the default flow rates for our methods are, are chosen to optimize um, your separations there. Um, if you guys have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, I'd be happy to answer your guys' questions. Uh, you need contact information for our sales reps or distributors, feel free to reach out to me. I can keep in contact with them. Uh, but I appreciate your guys' time today um, and look forward to talking to you guys in the future. Thank you, Josh, for taking the time to speak to us today about this topic. I would like to also thank all of you for joining us today, and Teledyne ISCO would like to wish all of you a safe and happy holiday season. Thank you.